Iman, what's going on, man? Jimmy, what's up, man? How you doing today? Good, good. Thanks for uh, taking time to be on the show, man. Uh, you know, I was reflecting on our time that we spent together at the University of Indianapolis, because that's where we first crossed paths, man. You know, I, I had to live in an upperclassman dorm my, my first year, and you were my first friend on campus, man. Like, the chance to, to see where you are now with all the adversity you've overcome, it, it's really a pleasure to have you on the show, and, and thanks for making some time for me today. Yeah, man. Uh, I appreciate I appreciate the kind words, and I'll actually never forget the first time I met you because you just had such a positive spirit and energy about you. You were very welcoming, and so um, yeah. although I was maybe your first friend on campus, I remember just taking a lot from that experience based on how positive you were and how how yeah. much light you were. A nice shirt too, by the way. Rest oh, yeah. Papers. I, I thought I thought you'd like this. I go with the classic bill for you today. Yeah. yeah, man. But you know, and just to give people context, you know, I lived in Carmel with my parents, like only stayed a couple of days at a time with family. So going from a, a suburb to to college uh, with with Iman's friendship made it a lot easier. So you come from Seymour, and that's <laughs> that's an unusual uh, upbringing uh, for anybody that knows Southern Indiana and the culture down there. What was it like, your your upbringing? You know, it's one of those things that I look back on. And at the time, I didn't really understand what got me there, how I was there, or how I was supposed to fit in. But I'm actually really glad it happened. Uh, because although it was a tr struggle, it was a challenge being different than most of the people we went with, being a rural space. I learned a lot about what it means to almost like a salesman, right? I don't mean to say conform to what people need, but really understand what it's like to serve people outside of yourself. Right. Um, so I think at the time I hated it, but now that I'm an adult and I can really reflect back on it, I'm absolutely so thankful that I ended up in Seymour, Indiana. You know, it's, it's tough. I'm thinking like at the time that you grew up, there was a lot of animosity toward the Middle East because like, there was the war on terror. Like, did, did your name, Iman Tucker, threaten your your friends uh, at school? I mean, I feel like with Indiana, there's going to be some preconceived biases and stuff, you know? I think at that age and at that point in my life, I was kind of unaware of some people's prejudice or how some people view things. Yeah. And so I tried to always let that be the last resort. Now, was that the reality? I doubt it. Honestly, looking back on it, I remember... Yeah. specifically with sports a lot of times hearing specific slurs or specific things that people would say just based out of sheer ignorance of they want to insult somebody and it's easiest it's the lowest hanging fruit yeah. uh, but on the same ticket though there were so many people that embraced me and really wanted to learn about me my name my culture where I came from and all that stuff so yeah the good there was definitely that balance of the bad as well but either way it, it grew me and it taught me a lot well, you know, and, I, and I'm just thinking about your career now as a DJ. Uh, you've certainly found a lot of solace in, in music and being able to create that. How much of music was a way for you to not have resentment? I, I know growing up with my dad as a musician, I've depended on that through tough, you know, last few years and everything we've gone through. Um, that's a great question. And <laughs> It's another one of those things where as I'm connecting the dots backwards, it's always easy to connect the dots, you know, when you reflect on things. But in the time I'm I'm hearing yeah. stuff like John Cougar Mellencamp, I'm hearing like yeah. rock, 80s rock, I'm hearing all kinds of stuff. And although at the time it's much like food, I didn't really have a palate to enjoy that type of music. But as I've gotten older and now that I do a lot of commercial type events, it all makes sense now. And now I'm able to really go back and appreciate it. But in middle school and high school, even though I was different than everybody, I was always the guy playing the music and making a playlist. Yeah. I had no clue it's going to like take itself into DJing as a career of music, but it was definitely something that allowed me to uh, express myself and right. express some of my values through, through language and through music for sure. Well, and how would you define DJ? Because when I think of DJ, I went into radio and TV as like an air personality with uh, a frequency that people tune into. How would you define what you do? Yeah. Uh, another good question. Actually, I wear a DJ chain now. Some people think I'm just trying to show off or be cool or <laughs> it's a name tag. But really what I did was, is I bought the chain because it was a breakthrough because for a while I hated the phrase DJ because whenever I tell people, actually, you know, I got 
multiple degrees at UND. I got my MBA, but I'm actually not doing anything in the corporate space. I am going to go be a DJ. The first thing people thought was that I'd be a um, an older gentleman at weddings, the creepy dude that plays music at weddings. <laughs> That's what everybody thought. And this is no slight to wedding DJs because obviously they make some of the best experiences ever. But for me, I think I let everybody define the term DJ and I didn't define it for myself. And so some people thinking disc jockey, I'm carrying crates around. But then for me, what I really found out was as much like anything, it's just a culture curator. It's a chance for me to show people things they haven't heard before, but then also cross it and remix it with something that they love. And so I think of a DJ as a musician. I think of turntables as an instrument. And when I started thinking like that in my career, that's when I noticed things started to shift and opportunities started to change as well. Well, and I I know you grew up with uh, your grandparents. Uh, What what kind of music did you listen to when you were at home? Oh, they were Motown and Christian music. So we listened to K-Love and Motown. That was pretty much it. But I mean, we watched a lot of sports together. So naturally, we'd catch a lot of the popular songs. Um, But that was right around the time that YouTube started to get really popular. So although they listened to their own thing and I got to experience some of the older music, I was taking my own journey of hip hop and my own journey of R&B. And those were pretty much like the core three genres that I rested in at that time of my life. Did you play any instruments, uh, you know, guitar, anything of the sort to to release some energy? (laughs) So I did play the saxophone. I was the uh, student athlete that also was in band. Um, and so two cultures definitely that conflict a lot in terms of like who you hang out with. <laughs> um, but I, I really kind of, I didn't take it serious because I didn't understand the importance of music. And I certainly didn't understand the importance that music was going to have on my life, but right. the saxophone was my first instrument I picked up. And, uh, I actually think I want to get back into it. Yeah. Well, and, and I'm only asking, cause you know, my dad, uh, aside from being a guitar player, uh, harmonica, uh, he was also a singer. Do you have any uh any ability to sing or no <laughs> um so, well sometimes i can never post my dj videos that i actually record myself of, of venues because i'm singing in the background <laughs> and sometimes you catch a little bit of that off key in, in the microphone but i will say the more you're around music and the more you try the closer you'll get to being better that's for sure yeah well and, and we've already established that we met each other uh on campus at und what what ultimately kind of brought you there was that the original plan no um the original plan was not you Andy. i kind of I had a conflated um perception of how good i thought i was at my sport at the time and for those that don't know i was running track um i really only ran about a season and a half based on you know sickness illness and maybe we talk about that later maybe we don't but yeah. In my mind, I wanted to go big university. I thought that was the only way that I was going to make everybody proud if I was at a power five school, big conference, whatever. Yeah. And so then I start taking my visits just as a student and I'm saying, hey, let me meet the track coach. I'm sending in my times so like, eh, no, thanks. I mean, we will we'll let you walk on. But anything other than that, it's not going to work. And so then I had to change my strategy. And actually, one of my coaches, he at the time, Ernie Clark, he was a um, coach in Bloomington. So I traveled from Seymour to Bloomington to work out with him. Yeah. But he was a UND grad. And in fact, he was Scott Fangman, our head coach. He was his first recruit. And so he's like, look, mm. I just want you to take your ego down about 10 notches and just check out the university, meet the coach and let me know what you think after the fact. I trusted this guy with everything. So I did exactly as he said. And when I showed up on campus, there was an experience and there was an enlightenment of, I actually think this is going to work. I did. I still didn't want to go, but I thought it might be able to work. Um, so that's the, uh, I would say the pre-story to the experience that yeah. we had. Well, and, I, and I'll tell you what ultimately got me there. Okay. Because what, what got me there was I was a volunteer patient for physical therapy and I figured, Hey, if I'm having a horrible day, I can go over to the physical therapy department. They'll get me right. How important was that coach in just being a mentor, a guiding force? Cause you sometimes need that one person to just keep you there in a place where you need to be despite the the difficulties. Yeah. Uh, Coach Fangman, he was my rock for sure. He was a very spiritually driven leader. And in, in that you got a lot of life coaching and a lot of life advice. And so I was in his yeah. office literally every other day, just trying to connect, not even as, a, as an athlete, just as a human. And um, he was so good at really giving me perspective. And I felt like I was getting ego checks every single time I was in there. But at that stage as a, um, testosterone fooled 18 year old young man <laughs> thinks literally he's owed the world 
without any work. That's what I needed. I needed to get humbled on the daily. And then I'd show up to track and my teammates, I had some teammates that are 24 years old. And so mm. they would just put a physical beat down on you in the weight room on the track. And it just, it would, it would get to that ego. It would touch that ego in a way, but then to have that coach that could really give you perspective, but also hold you accountable. It just took my, my thought process to a different level at 18 for sure. Well, and ultimately you ended up uh, participating with UND for, um, six seasons i guess of eligibility um and we we can kind of go through the laundry list of setbacks and, and injuries i mean a long process i read the piece that kravitz did that uh, kind of run through uh you mentioned you were only able to participate about a year and a half i mean what, what was the the timeline of all that yeah um so freshman year i think i ran maybe two meets and then by the time the semester ended i was injured done for the year Come back my sophomore year, I was terrible. I'm not going to lie. I was really bad, really weak. Just didn't really understand my body anymore. Um, come back junior year, get hurt again. Come back senior year, fracture my back. And then I have pretty much two more seasons left. So I've burned four years already. I've ran maybe one of those years. Yeah. And then the last two years, I really only practiced once a week and ran on the weekends. I think we all mm -hmm. knew um, my, my role had changed a lot. I went from more of like trying to be a physical leader to really just try to support my teammates and make sure that they were taken care of. And the love that my coach gave me, I was able to, I wanted to try to pass that on to my teammates. And so in that process, I stopped taking myself so serious. And what I found out was the less serious I took myself and the more I was thinking about how I could serve the people around me, I actually found out that I was able to start being able to be more competitive and get back into that space. And so um, my last two years of my graduate degree when I was getting my MBA, I would say, just success wise, mentality wise, and physically, that was probably the best I ever felt. But I think taking the pressure off of myself and putting the prep my, myself into a space of, like I mentioned, just service, just right. be there, just be right. life, be energy, much like you were to me when I first met you, a positive light, like just contagious energy, be that and whatever happens from it happens from it. But uh, just there to serve, man. Yeah, and um, we can talk about it if you want. I, it's one of the most uh, impactful things about your story. You're a cancer survivor. You know, it's tough to go to college when you're healthy. <laughs> I, I can't imagine going under those circumstances. Uh, what do you recall feeling at that time? Oh, man, it was, you know, being away from my grandparents, my little safe space in Seymour was definitely an adjustment. I think for many young people, something like that is an adjustment. Um, but being away from them and then really trying to navigate what it means to be a man, but what it means to be a student, what it means to be an athlete, yeah. but what it means to survive, like it's, it's a different perspective. And I always tell people that cancer sometimes is the best thing that's ever happened to me because it gave me a perspective that I didn't have beforehand. And it's not the first time either. The first time I thought I had perspective, but it was the second time in college that I really got a chance to be like, dang. I had this big scary moment where I thought my life was going to be taken from me. I overcame it. And then I went right back to my old habits of just making everything about me. And so the last time it happened, it was, I don't want to say, I think I needed it because that sounds very um, negative, but in, in a strange way, ad adversity and conflict really can change a person in a positive way and in a negative way. And I think for, for me and my support system, we knew that we want to do whatever it took to make that thing a positive thing. Yeah. So what did it feel like? I'm not really sure because I didn't try to think about it. I tried to just, in the cliche saying of make the most <laughs> out of each experience, that's literally all I had at this point because I, I, I didn't have much else. Yeah. Well, and it's not the same thing, but as far as like physical pain, you know, there were days that I would have cerebral palsy and, didn't want to show up to class. Um, and I, I kind of know what you're talking about when something profound happens in your life. Like once my dad died, everything else really didn't matter because <laughs> the most painful thing that could happen to me already did. Was that was it kind of that thing of I've overcome this. Now I'm a badass. I, I, I thought you said in another clip that it, it kind of made you feel arrogant in, in a way. <laughs> yeah. It did. Um, and I can tell you've done your homework, man. I, I really appreciate that. It makes the talking easier, but it did. It does make you feel arrogant when I'm talking about the second chance, the first chance. That's what I became is I became super arrogant of like, all right, I just got a college scholarship and I yeah. ran maybe like six weeks this year. Yeah. I, I did not start training until March of my senior year. 
Right. <laughs> and then I ran three months and get a scholarship. I show up. Um, school is easy. I'm not gonna lie. For me, school was super easy. I didn't study. I went to class just because we had to as a student athlete. But I mean, I just kind of had my way my first year, mm -hmm. you know, up until the injury, up until the sickness. And it's so weird, like how when we handle things, we try to make everything about us and we take all the burden, we put it on ourselves. Much like you said, you just walk around and people are affirming your story, too. So everywhere you go, oh, my gosh, you're the guy, you know, that ran track with cancer and you did it all. You're my hero. And you hear that so much. It's like you let all that validation go to your head and you forget where your true validation comes from. You've mentioned that you were always kind of a DJ music guy from the time you were in middle school. When did it sort of morph into a profession? Well, you hear people say all the time, you hear them say, follow your passions, follow your passions. And although I'm doing something I'm really passionate about right now, I actually don't agree with that very often. Okay. And the reason why is because at the end of the day, what's one of the first things we got to do? Our number one rule as a human is to survive, you know, to make it to the next day. Mm -hmm. And part of that is being able to have income. Part of that's being able to support a system, support a family, all these things. And so right. I see so many people chasing a passion, but I think for me, what changed is, is yes, I have a passion for music. Yes, I have a passion for cultures, but that in itself wasn't really what set the foundation. What right. set the foundation was vetting those passions and saying, how is a way that I could monetize those? And so when I start thinking about that, I'm thinking, okay, well, I can't rap. I can't sing. <laughs> I haven't picked up a saxophone in years. Um, I pretty much don't think I can manage an artist. It seems like a lot. I'm going to be a DJ because at that point, I got to play the right music. Right. But then as I got into it, as I found a system that actually worked, and as I put mentors in my life that could really allow me to sustain myself with music, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden it became a passion because once I built a brand and once our team built this brand, now all of a sudden I can start expressing myself through the passion. But I think sometimes people, they skip the step of actually vetting the process before they start to like dive into the process and say, this is what I'm going to do full time. Well, and, and clearly based on any tape that you'll see or listen to, he, he has his skills, folks. Check out the tapes on SoundCloud and everywhere else. But um, we'll get into how you built your brand, uh, Believe Brand Entertainment. But what are some ways that you thought of in order to monetize something? I mean, I've talked with Mike G, who's a lifestyle food journalist, and I think there might have to be a DJ union at some point because at some point you just slash uh, your rates to the point that everyone else is trying to undercut each other. Is that sure. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And shout out to Mike G. I actually just had him wearing. He sold it to me. Um, he oh, he go. got an outfit for one of our shows. And said, <laughs> oh, you know, yeah. I always show love, but um if I understand the question properly, for me, I don't particularly worry about the whole concept of undercutting anymore because I, I, I expect in Indianapolis that the ex expectation for entertainment may not be as high as a Vegas and Miami or in LA. Right. And so earlier on in my career, I dealt a lot with that of me assuming that I had value. So saying I should charge this or I should charge that. Well, what I found was is the people that were undercutting me, they were just as good as me. They had, you know, just as many opportunities. They had just as many skills. They played the same music. And so then it became, well, what's the differentiator? Like, if I want to charge this price, right. how am I going to justify charging this? And so that's when I was like, you know what? I'm going to become a musician. I'm going to become a producer. I'm going to make things that you can only hear if you hear me play. You'll never hear it again the same way because people can't recreate it. And with the whole mindset they were talking about earlier with service and being what my teammates need, a lot of DJs are very arrogant. They think like, you know, I'm the I'm the man, I'm this, I'm that. But at the end of the day, we're playing music that we didn't even write. So it's <laughs> like, yeah. right. let, me, yeah. let me humble myself here and let me not approach every single, I don't care if it's three people or 3,000 people or 30,000 people. Let me approach every single situation like I am here for each one of these people here, right. connect with them as best as I can, show them love, connect them with a stranger and give them not just music, but an experience. And when you start talking about experiences, that's a very emotional, that's a very um, interpersonal connection. Right. And when you start marketing that, you start displaying that and you start showing that truth and that authenticity, and then you don't have to worry about undercutting because people know that when you are in the house, 
right. they're going to get their money's worth. No questions asked. And I think security sometimes is the biggest thing that uh, these corporations and these teams are looking for somebody they can trust. Yeah. I mean, um, Mike Bray, who does a lot of uh, DJing here in town, he dealt with the uh, mass shooting in Broad Ripple where he had to leave the club. I mean, I, I'm asking you just as a entertainer, are you are you nervous having to perform in public venues with where the world is right now? Uh, am I nervous? Um, not to go down a spiritual rabbit hole, not really, because if it's my time, you know, as a believer, I believe it's my time. But at the same sure. time, we are very we are very specific about the type of gigs we say yes to. And that is something, one of those non-compromising values that we want to have. So if we're there, one of the questions we ask in our technical writer, which for those that don't know, a technical writer is the type of things that DJ requests for the set. Mm -hmm. uh, we request that I can bring some of my people there with me to kind of keep an eye out on things. We request that they have either security on the venue or they allow me to pay for security to come in. And so yeah, you know, it, it sucks that we live in a space and a time where we have to be aware of those things, but right. protecting the security and safety of the, the the patrons there is very important to me. And so I don't want to create a space where the energy is really high to even have that opportunity if mm -hmm. we're not going to set every single step beforehand to know that people are going to be taken care of at all times. Well, and, and you said that uh, DJ Iman stands out among them all. Uh, what What makes you the best DJ in comparison to others? Well, one of my mentors always told me if I don't think I'm the best and I have no chance of ever being the best, you know, I'm sure there's so many DJs out here in the city, even people that teach me, people that perform in the city that have something better to offer than me. But yeah. in my mind, I tell myself every morning that today I'm going to be the best and I may not be the I may not be the best DJ all the time, but maybe I'm going to be the best DJ on this given night. Yeah. And maybe I'm going to give people the best experience. And so for me, I think it's just all about making sure people feel celebrated. And that's the number one priority. Celebrated, celebrate, celebrate, celebrate. And so if I see somebody that I don't know, they got a cool shirt on, I'm on the microphone, I'm calling you out 200 feet away. <laughs> Well, you need to feel that love. You need to feel that energy far away. And I know that sometimes as DJs, we can kind of let the music speak too much on our behalf. And so for me, it's the celebration that I think separates what we do. Well, and, uh, you know, my dad would play when he wasn't playing in a full band, he would have a duet and would have a set list. Uh, everybody has a different approach to an hour. What, how do you break down a set? Yeah, so I really, there's music I like, and then there's music consumers like, and it's very different. Right. And so for me, when I break down a set, I really try to take people on a journey and I think, okay, what's something that can take people's guards down? I don't know if you've ever stepped out, but sometimes if I were to step out at nighttime to party, I kind of feel a little on edge when I first get there. I'm like checking the scene out, making sure, you know, everything's safe. And then as the night goes on, I'm able to warm up. Well, for me, we like to work our sets like that too, of like, all right, let's start off slow. Let's start off smooth. Let's start off, give some vibes make people sing along, start making people feel connected. And then once people feel safe and connected, now we're going to take you on a journey. That's when we start to get into more high tempo dance, some heavy hitting hip hop, some stuff that you can really feel it and just to kind of feel yourself a little bit. But then right before you leave, it's almost like a roller coaster. We take you up, we get you to the top, and then we take you right back down. Okay. Whereas some DJs, you know, they just redlining the whole time. They just at the top <laughs> every single the whole hour and then people are exhausted. But now nah, we want to take you on a musical journey for sure. And I've given, you know, different public speaking events and, and different things. Uh, is it tougher to perform in front of larger crowds or smaller ones? Is it tougher? I think sometimes with the accessibility of a smaller crowd, typically if it's a smaller crowd, that means they can come talk to you more often and they can suggest what you should be doing or they should just try to have conversations learn if you're too close you know you have a small crowd you'll just see people take their hands and try to put them <laughs> on top of their turntables and start spinning oh, wow. and for me you know that's that's something that I, we're trying to move away from because we think it takes away from the overall experience and so honestly believe it or not like right. I think harder, smaller crowds are tougher. You know, I don't have the stage. I don't have the lights. I don't have the screens. I don't have all the things in the experience that make it easier for me to have an authoritative space to decide where the vibe is going. You know, I can have the person that's writing my check literally two feet away from me at a party of 20 people and saying, sir, you should be doing this. And then instead of a DJ, now I'm just a jukebox. Right. Well, and, and this seems kind of obvious because I mean, it's it's sort of the job, but how much of being a DJ is playing stuff on the fly like you might go in with one set and 
it's not going so well. Like, has it, has it said ever bombed <laughs> before? Um, earlier in my career, I would say bombing was particularly uh, a, a common. Okay. We would bomb the first hour or so until we figured out what the crowd actually liked, and then we would start to get settled in. But to me, that's why preparation is so important. And that's one thing I tell all the DJs that I teach. Any DJ I mentor, I say, prepare, prepare. Right. So what does preparation mean? It means get all of your DJ tools ready. Get any, like, if you want to put a guitar behind it that you know is going to bring a certain crowd of people in, prepare it ahead of time so you know where it's at, how to get to it. Organize all your music by decade. So if you look at somebody, you can assume, okay, this person probably, their prime was in the 80s. So now let me move over into that space. Oh, but check it out. Their kids are here. Their kids look about 12. Okay, so they probably like music within the past five years. So right. let me try to blend those together. But that's not possible if I'm not taking the time preparing all the information ahead of time to make sure I'm ready yeah did you have any formal music education I mean are you the reason why I asked that is are you counting or is it simply by the feel of the music and just sort of flowing with it <laughs> so I have no sense. music um no music theory background I do I have been trained very um closely with the, the concepts of DJing through decademics but we're not particularly sitting there talking about keys. We are talking about counts and we're talking about how music is structured, but in the sense of like me counting music out, that was a ton of me doing audits on my sound and saying like, okay, well, why is, why do I like this part of the sound versus that part of the sound? And I want to relate this to others people work as well, because many times we'll just consume things, whether I'm a, a work in an automotive store, or whether I work in a clothing store, we just consume things. Mm -hmm. But how often do we actually sit down and audit things and say, this is why I like this. And this is why I don't like this. Or how do these things work together and start thinking of it like a puzzle, and then putting the pieces together and then having a full experience as opposed to me just saying, well, uh, I think it's yeah. about time for me to start making some noise on this song. <laughs> well, in one way that I've made music interesting for me, because I get tired of the same spotify playlist there's great mashups on uh youtube one that stands out to me is like uh back in black and uptown funk like how much of djing for you is merging those styles and allowing the art to be showcased that's that's the coolest thing to me you know so i'm thinking you actually may have missed your calling to be a dj because that's exactly what it's about when we were talking about earlier yeah we were talking about making sounds that people have never heard before what you're talking about right there the fact that you can pull out that mashup right on the top of your head yeah that's what we're trying to do we're trying to remix a song so uniquely that when you go back and hear the original it's just not going to hit the same as it did at that one show that iman and his friends and his guys and believe bread entertainment was at right. that's exactly it right there I love it. I love it. Um, let's see here. Uh, okay, here's something important for you, because I know you have a good uh, Instagram showing all the visual components of your performance. I've uh, I've watched a lot of Stevie Ray Vaughan, Prince, you know, masters of their craft as musicians. Uh, but a big thing they talk about is like the clothes they wear, the visual and physical component of it. How much of that is important to you with the jerseys you wear, all the style that you apply to the performance? Yeah, that's very, very, very important because at the end of the day, like as a DJ, if you're influencing people's emotions, eventually, I guess that makes you an influencer in some regard. Yeah. So yeah. For me being a detail oriented person, we think that every part of the experience matters. So early on in my DJ career, I would literally wear all black all the time. And I recognize, well, dang, like this isn't allowing me to stand out because, you know, the DJ down the streets plays the same music I do. And so what is another way that we could elevate the experience? And so that's when the outfits and the chains and the hats and all the little accessories started to matter because we're like, for some people, that's what it takes to, for them to trust you. They need to think that, you know, this person is well-dressed, this person's well-kept, this person's cool, this person's X, Y, and Z, whatever variable you want to put into it. Right. And so um any entertainer you look at them they have a stylist they take that stuff very serious and so i'm thinking if they're taking themselves serious well it makes sense because they have millions of fans and they're all this all over and so it's easy to justify that and say well i'm just not going to do that because i'm not michael jackson i'm not prince i'm not you know marshmallow i'm not all these big name people right. but at the same time i think that it's our own lack of confidence and self-worth in ourselves where we're at that keeps us where we're at and so it's like, you know, if Prince is going to take care of his appearance like that, then why shouldn't DJ Amon as well? 
People mm -hmm. are still paying for my service as well. I'm still a professional. I'm still doing this to make a living. So right. why not take that more serious? Even though I don't care. Like I could wear a hoodie and a, a beanie the rest of my life and be black. <laughs> cool. Like right. this is for the people, for them to see it and them to them to take something away from it for sure. Well, and I'm just thinking from a financial standpoint, I mean, and the jewelry doesn't have to be expensive. It, sh it shines in the light the same. I mean, if it looks good on you, that's what matters, right? When it comes to style. Sure. And, and and plus, too, you know, if you play it right, sometimes you can be a tax write-off. Shout out to the <laughs> IRS. But, you know, you just got to yeah. understand business from a full circle to understand how to make it work for your business. Tell me some of your clients, man. You're you're on the way up. You got a lot of, uh, you got an extensive Rolodex, so show off. <laughs> <sighs> you know, I've been blessed, man. I've been so blessed to have almost every experience that a DJ would want. You know, we're talking about NBA, NFL, NCAA, WNBA. You know, got a spot on the radio, um, got to travel with one of my favorite artists and perform with him, Aaron Cole, got to be invited by tour to join them guys for a tour. And like looking back on it, it, it feels very insignificant. But I think if you would have told me 10 years ago that this was going to be my life, I would have been so lit and so ecstatic. But really what I think it comes down to is people see the clients and I get DJs that ask me all the time how they get into that space. And I tell them, I say the same thing I've been saying for the most part of this podcast Take yourself out of it. Think of yourself as if you were the customer. What would be your expectation for a DJ? And then go do those things. Um, and so then that's when we got an activation with Nike. We got to perform um, oh, down at one of the retail shops uh, at hang time for the national championship football that was in town in, in January. Yeah, I almost said December, but January. Right. Right. Uh, that's when we started to get, we started to use our Instagram to show off other people's products. And that's when people started coming up to us saying like, Hey, do you want to sponsor an ad? Do you want to post this thing and boost it and do this X, Y, and Z? We'll pay you. We'll take the pictures for you. We'll give you the clothes, um, X, Y, and Z. But again, yeah. it all came from a space of understanding what the client needed first. And now all of a sudden the clients are coming in. As indie natives, we're going to be biased to this. Uh, but our city is known for hosting a lot of things. I really don't know a place better in the Midwest, including Chicago, uh, with all the things that come here. I mean, have you ever thought about moving to a different place or, or accepting a different offer in a bigger market? Yeah, you know, that's that's always the easiest thing to do, right? Because right. once you start getting some steam, you think, man, you know how people say if you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. <laughs> I actually think that's reversed because if you can make it in Indiana as a creative, you can make it anywhere. No kidding. You know, the creative culture just isn't celebrated like it is out in a space like L.A. And I'm not going to lie, when I take a trip out to L.A. for a couple of weeks and I see everything that's going on out there, it is so easy for me to want to pack up and move and try to just do the L.A. thing. But I recognize Indy has been a big foundation, a big base. My mentors are here. My family is here. My businesses are here. Everything is here. And so although I may spend time, uh, an extended period of time in another space, I know that at the end of the day, my heart is to always make sure that Indianapolis and Indiana is the priority that they're taken care of. I am a Hoosier and I take a lot of pride in that. And that's not to say that I won't move around. I won't experience other cultures. But like I said, I will always have property in Indiana. And this will always be home base. No, I, I totally agree with you. And, uh, you know, as the entertainment space changes, do, would you ever consider taking a day part on a radio station and just putting a mix together daily? That's a good question. You know, I think for um, two of my goals, like actually as a kid, I want to be a jeweler and I want to be a radio host. Yeah. Um, I just love getting on here and like the, uh, the, the, the radio personality voice. And above all, I love getting to ask people questions. Like I would love, you know, just kind of like what you're doing, just really do my homework and, and give somebody a chance to share their story and their testimony. I'll tell you, just having worked in uh, different radio stations, there's nothing more fun than watching somebody else screw up. Um, <laughs> have you ever made a mistake during a set where it was so obvious? You're like, my bad guys, let's do that again. <laughs> or, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there's like a saying in the DJ culture, and I think this applies for life too. A good, a good DJ isn't one that makes mistakes or one that does not make mistakes. A good DJ is very good at covering up their mistakes. There you go. And yeah. so typically if I do make a mistake, the first thing I try to think is what did I just do and how can I make the mistake again? So it looks like it was intentional. Right. <laughs> so you, um, you can flip it around at least. <laughs> yeah. If the music ever cuts out, this is always my go-to. So if there's anybody in entertainment watching this, regardless of what kind of entertainment you're in, if all the sound stops, 
blame it on the crowd and tell them their energy isn't high enough and you're not going to get the music starting <laughs> in until they get lit. And so then once they get lit, you scram them to get your computer back up and then you're loading in the next song and going. But mistakes, literally, if I listen to one of my mis- sets, I p- could probably call out a mistake every 60 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you've talked too about this and I think about uh, Snoop Dogg and how great of a performance he had at the Super Bowl. Is there an age limit? to this sort of thing, to this line of work? Mm. Yeah, it seems like these questions are super timely because I've been watching a lot of podcasts this past week and um, Jay Espinoza out in the Bay, he said he doesn't feel like DJs start peaking until their mid-30s into their mid-40s. Yeah. So I'm thinking I'm 28 right now and sometimes um, a lot of my professional business mentors that are kind of in the cadence of being in an office all day, they're like, when are you going to quit this thing, man, and start a family and, you know, do something that's, safe and probably better for a guy your age and i think for the longest time i try to submit myself to their leadership but the more i'm finding out how much i love this stuff and how fun it is but also how much experience it actually takes to be legitimate i'm not surprised djs don't peak until they're 35 yeah because as a professional i'm sure you're learning this as you've been going on through your career what you knew at 22 Mm. when you were younger is not what you know now as a grown man no. And every year, the more you practice and the more you flex that muscle of consistency, there's more to be learned and the more to be had. And so I keep thinking to myself, like, knowing I got at minimum seven more years until the average DJ peaks mm-hmm. that does this full time. I'm thinking, I got to get going. I got to learn. I got to know everything. So when that seven year hits, it's like, boom, we're off the ground and we're flying. And we're still young, even after seven yeah. years, man. So yeah, we're not even halfway through yet, <laughs> Lord willing. <laughs> We, we got we got youth on our side, but um, right. what are some future projects, ambitions that you have for yourself? Lamar? Let me start with uh, my my goals for myself and let me talk about my goals for my community. Go for it. I think they're very they're very they're very um, connected. I think yeah. for myself, it's like I want to challenge myself as much as possible. I never saw myself as a musician. And so I think that because I saw that weakness of, wow, I'm not a musician. I want to attack that space. I want to learn how to be a musician. I want to learn how to overcome that doubt. And I want to learn how to overcome perhaps that challenge, that wall. And I don't care what anybody says. I don't care what anybody thinks. Like I'm going to do it because I feel like this is what I need to do. This is a weakness I have. Another weakness I have is comparison. I hate trying to compare myself to another DJ. So what am I going to do? I'm going to try to learn enough skills so I can start competing against other DJs. Mm -hmm. Because I think if I want to live a full experience within my career, then I need to make sure that I'm challenging all the things that are those gaps those places where maybe I haven't been where I need to be for myself. And so I think at the end of the day, for my own personal goals is continue to challenge myself and make sure people know that they matter, that they're valued and that they're celebrated. But as far as community goals, I think about, dang, I was a broke college student when I got started. Um, It was my track stipends and these uh, refund checks that we got back from the government that allowed me to even start my DJ career. Mm -hmm. But then I think about, you know, just the money and the financial opportunity that DJing had for me in college. It really sustained me. And I'm thinking like, you know, a lot of people in lower income spaces, they feel like their only way out is through sports or music. And I'm thinking, wow, DJing is a very, very possible entry level space to get into sports and music and I want to make sure people understand that I want to make sure that people in the hood people wherever you're from they recognize that this is possible for you to get out of your situation and then once you get in there and if if you have a career anything like mine now you have contacts in WNBA you have contacts in the NBA you have contacts to really work in the space and to be put into rooms that otherwise you would have never belonged in because Mm. people just wouldn't have accepted you Mm. Yeah. And make a difference yeah. and show you do matter and you do have an opportunity. And so I have one intern right now. Um, he's a, a high school student from Westfield. You know, he came from inner city Chicago and now he's down in Carmel just trying to figure out, you know, a much similar situation like me and Seymour, like, where do I belong? Where do I fit in? And so mentoring him has just taught me so much about what we want to do long term. And we yeah. want to multiply that. We want to send that to as many people as possible, because that's what really matters. You know, the money's cool. The opportunities are cool. The brand is cool. But like, we want people to feel purpose, value and meaning. And we want them to know that they mean they, they matter, too. And so if it's through DJing and that's what skill we have fine but if it's through something else and dj is not your thing well hey guess what you learned how to dj and we're going to get you where you need to go now well and you 
uh, mentioned the operative word. I, I know from growing up in the industry with my dad being with uh, Bob and Tom and everything else that I've done, like you, uh, it's about relationships, the people that you connect with. Um, let me see. Uh, you know, we all listen to music. We all try to raise the vibration. What's what's something that everybody, regardless of age, color, creed, can do to uh, raise the vibration? Because we need it now. Oh, man. I think the first thing you need to do is just be ready to understand. And I feel like people have two main ways of talking. They're either talking or they're preparing to talk and nowhere in that space is listening. But I think when it comes to consuming, it's much like that as well. Like they are, they are almost talking and they say, this is what I want. This is what I need. I'm only going to listen to what I like. I'm going to stay in my lane. But imagine if you opened up your ears, you opened up your heart to try to understand what this other culture, this other thing is about without any input of what you think it's about. You just become a student and listen. You hit sit, sit in sonship and you just listen. Mm -hmm. That's the first step because then what you're going to find out is, is although we're very, very different in terms of practicality, at the end of the day, when you hear people talk about their values, things are the same. It's typically empathy. It's like, I want somebody to have a better experience. And this is how I think it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, whether you're on right side, left side, Muslim, Christian, atheist, whatever you are, I think people, for the most part, good people just want people to be heard and understood. That's it, man. That's it. Um, I'm not trying to create more competition for you. This is for the new generation coming up. Um, what are some costs and basic equipment that any DJ wanting to get started should uh, purchase? It might vary. I don't know. The first thing you should purchase is going to sound a little crazy. First thing you should purchase is a mentor because right. your mentor is going to save you money. They're going to save you time. They're going to give you direction. When I started, I bought the cheapest gear I could find. And guess <laughs> what? Four months later, I grew out of my gear. So guess what? I had to sell it at half the cost, buy something else, sell it at half the cost, buy something else. But if I would have had a mentor and I would have been just gigging along with them, setting up their gear, getting paid to set up their gear, but then practicing on it at another time, I would have saved so much time and money. And I think I would be in a different space completely if I would have just submitted myself to mentorship early on. Now, I didn't know I was going to be a DJ. I didn't know I was going to go there. So it's easy for me to say this now, but it doesn't matter what you want to do. Just invest in a mentor and find out if you like it first, and then it's going to take you to a whole nother level. So um, before you buy any equipment, I would say that. And, you know, mentors, you can find those at any cost, whether it's online or in person. For folks who want to be mentored by you, how can they reach out and get more information about what you do? Yeah, you know, mentorship is very important to me. And even just like business connection, teaching yeah. people about business, um, you know, having that background at UND. I learned a lot from having business mentors and professionals. But um, anywhere, just type in Iman, I-M-A-N, Tucker on Instagram, Twitter, Google, Facebook, whatever, and you'll find me. And typically, I'm always the first one to see my own messages. Um, you know, I have sometimes people that help out with some of that stuff when it comes to booking, but I'm typically the first one to see it. And so... Uh, if I know that you're serious, I know that this is something that you really want. I want to make sure that I'm making that time for you. So, Folks, to hear this again, you can check out my website, jbkonair.com, or you can get the podcast anywhere that you get your podcast by searching JBK On Air. Until next time, have a great day and a better tomorrow.